Ass Brief, a strategic guide on how not to be an asshole at work. You'll learn about bad bosses, how they can be detected and handled, as well as how to tell if you happen to be one. Join an executive and an executive coach, both artists working in marketing and advertising from over two decades, who are here to offer you the ultimate guide on how to navigate any employment landscape. Here are your hosts, Eugene S. Robinson and Stephanie Payrollo. Welcome to the Bad Boss Brief. I am Stephanie Payrollo. And I am Eugene S. Robinson. And today we are doing episode 26, which is, this is a year anniversary of starting Bad Boss Brief. Hey, there we go. (laughs) Uh, Congrats to us. Exactly. We've had uh, 25 podcasts and one live in-person show. Uh, We should, we should make that a new year's resolution to do some more in 20, two more live shows in 2024. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about work friends and work spouses. Um, I was looking at the news over the uh, break, including the time when I was stuck on the East Coast because I couldn't get a flight on Alaska Airlines returning and everything just seemed really grim. So I thought, you know what, let's do something that's positive. Let's talk about work friends and the kind of deep relationships that we can have at work. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's positive, but (laughs) I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay because, you know, it quickly segues into what's become this kind of popular parlance thing to say, oh, that's my work wife or my work husband. And I'm like, I'm not digging on that 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 terminology necessarily. But work friend is might be nice, but we all know what it really means. And I, I don't like it. But <laughs> wait, wait, what, <laughs> don't you, what don't you like about it? Um, I, it, it, if if my wife comes home and is talking about to me about her work husband, I am instantaneously Irked. <laughs> I, I might not say anything, but I'm going to be irked. And I'll tell you something else. I'm going to be irked for a long time about it. <laughs> you know? Why? Uh, because work husband, I, uh, beyond anybody know, it's a very quick step from work husband to real husband. So, <laughs> you know, it's like that great line from Raging Bull. You yourself don't know what you yourself just said. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear any, if some guy's name starts appearing too much in the conversation, it's like, you're trying to tell me something without telling me something. And I don't know that I'm ready to hear what you're telling me. So, you know, uh, work friends. Perfect. That's perfect. Okay. Um, I don't actually, I disagree with that. (laughs) Oh, of course you do. (laughs) I think there's, I think there's two reasons, right? One is I have always had a longing for close friends at work. Right. One of the reasons that and I think I think a lot of people share this with me. One of the reasons that shows TV shows about work are very popular, whether it's The Sopranos or The Office or any police procedural, anything. Those are all essentially narratives about how people interact at work. Mm -hmm. And there's the people who are jerks, the people who are friends, whatever comes up. Affairs with each other. People also. That is true. People also have affairs. Although I have to say I'm just laughing because. I have a partner who frequently hears me talk about Eugene S. Robinson, who I have worked with, who I do a podcast with, who I talk to frequently with absolute aplomb, zero energy. A friend of mine said it best. She said, those who don't know me like me. Those who know me don't like me. (laughs) So I think he benefits from not knowing me. (laughs) Except he does. We have had meals together. But anyway. I digress. So the thing, I mean, what I think is interesting is that in the circumstances where I have had, and we'll just, we'll put aside the work spouse. In the circumstances where I've had a work friend, it has really changed what going to work meant for me. And I feel like I did much more effective work. I was much more creative. And, And I'll give you an example, right? In fact, I was, I saw a friend, an old friend, Um, over the holidays. And she reminded me of the story of how we met. We were both working at a large ad agency. Mm -hmm. She got there. And, you know, as most ad agencies were, it was very focused around alcohol, right? They Mm -hmm. gave out flasks at, you know, the Christmas party that were already full. They had an open bar, you know, people drank during the day. That was just, you know, that is kind of how it was in advertising. And she said she didn't drink. And The reason she didn't drink was that she was a recovering alcoholic, but she didn't say that. She just said she didn't drink. And people there said, you know, Stephanie doesn't drink either. 
I think she's like a Jesus freak or something. And so at the Christmas party where everybody else was drinking, my soon to be friend walked outside to have a cigarette and saw me chain smoking and started talking to me. And I was cussing like a sailor. Right. And she said, I don't know that this is the Jesus vibe that I was thinking of. Right. <laughs> and right. so we started talking. And it turns out we were both recovering alcoholics. Right. And that started a really deep friendship. One, it was a safe haven to be able to go into her office and be like, OK, here's one other person right. who is not going to be visiting the in-house bar at the end of the day. But we developed a friendship from that. And that job, even though there was all sorts of crazy was one of the most satisfying jobs I ever had because I knew that I had a a space and I also had a way to work with her. Like we actually had a lot of conflict. We worked in, we were peers, but we worked in departments that often came into conflict. But we had so much trust in each other that we could work through it. And we did, we both did great work there. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know what? I'm not going to disagree with you on that because as I think back on my work history, when I was at Adobe, I came, I, I did discover a kindred spirit. And uh, he he was the guy who I called also the craziest guy at Adobe. And he and I, I mean, he, you know who he looked like? He looked like Tobey Maguire, interestingly enough. Um, and so Spider-Man, for those of you who don't remember. And um, we bonded um, and... But it was almost the exact opposite. <laughs> you are, at one point, like he called me from a mental institution and tried to get me to help break him out because, of course, nobody else would help but me. You know, so uh, but I have to say, honestly, it kept me at that job longer than I would have ordinarily have stayed there. And much like what I've heard people say in the military, that we weren't there for any doctrinaire cause. Um, but I was there to watch out for him. And I'm presuming that he was there when he was not in the mental institution, watching out for me. And it did make the work, um, it, it improved the quality of not only the work relationship, but my relationship with other people at the work, as well as my work in total. So I think I'm going to agree with you on that. Yeah. And I've seen that. I mean, my daughter uh, is a nurse and she, when she was working in a big city emergency room and then a, a county hospital and, you know, in the ICU during the beginning of the pandemic, when, which, you know, as you know, started hitting in Seattle, she had really close friends and, mm-hmm. and they developed that kind of in the trenches, you know, right. camaraderie. And so I think, I think it's, it is important for a lot of people. What I do find though, is that people who lack those kind of emotionally connected relationships at work. And I talked to a lot of them in my executive coaching practice, mm-hmm. they long for it. And they end up feeling kind of often emotionally activated, right? Like someone will say something and it's like, what did they mean by that? What did, you know, and and we do when we feel like we're in, and I don't even want to say hostile environment, when we feel like we're in an unfamiliar environment or we're not necessarily connected, it changes us physiologically, right? And so I think that having a space, having people, having ways where you can be connected to someone, even as a work friend, superficial friend, can really change how you work. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is if you're listening to this and if you want a work friend, if you are looking around and wondering, why don't I have more connections at work? Here are a couple of things that you could do. And it's it's not that different from being a person who makes friends outside of work, right? Just be trustworthy, keep confidences, don't gossip, right? Like don't be an asshole. Right? Like that's the whole point of the show, right? How to not be an asshole. And then support others. Give credit to other people, compliment good work, praise in public, correct in private, and then ask for feedback, right? Mm -hmm. If there's somebody that you have an okay relationship, you haven't kind of crossed the barrier of like into to trust and real kind of collaboration, Mm -hmm. ask, Mm -hmm. what could we do to work more effectively? I I really would like to have some more, um, you know, connected relationships at work. Ask, get curious about what it is that, what it is that you can do. Any mm-hmm. other things that you can that you can think about? Yes, don't sleep with this friend. <laughs> I see a theme. I see a theme in our conversation today. Yes, it's best not to be having sex with people with people that you are working with yeah. in general. Yes, I think it needs to be said. <laughs> you know, you can't escape from the workplace. Do not do this. When things go south, as they might, it'll be miserable and unpleasant. Well, and you know, one of the things that I think is interesting too is that a lot of conversation has happened about Americans being very lonely. 
Mm. And I think that there's a subset of Americans who are white men who have a particularly difficult time making friends. Yep. And if they if they don't have friends from college, if they are not in, again, like you said, the military or an organization that it, it kind of encourages white men to bond with each other, whether it's sports or the police force, right. they, they have a lot of trouble. And I think what ends up happening is those men really rely, if they're heterosexual, they rely on their female partners. Mm-hmm to kind of be the sum total of their emotional support, where they talk about things, how they deal with things. And they become really isolated. And I think there are a lot of white men who have lost the aptitude for Mm -hmm. developing friendships of any kind. And so I could see a man in that situation over-indexing on a, a friend at work who's a woman. Also, if you see like life over 40, if you... I mean, you or we're the same age. So you certainly remember growing up and walking by places like the Terminal Bar, maybe, or whatever the equivalent was where you were. You see these guys who are like 50 years old, 60 years old, sitting in there. And, and, and these weren't just drunks. It provided a service in my life at this point, give it now I'm the age of the guys who I saw sitting there, but I have no interest in drinking. I say, you know, uh, uh, jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu fills that same regard. I spend two hours every morning. Uh, with a collection and women participate as well. So we've got women in the class, but generally that's the highest concentration of male involvement, energy, friendship thing that I have going every day. And that's every day. So, and I, I, you know, I think it exerts a a, a overall positive effect in my life in the workplace. However, it, it affected my workplace relationships in an interesting way because I didn't feel a need to be friendly with people at work because I already had my friends at jujitsu two hours of, which was spent before I got to work, you know, with people at jujitsu. So I, I found that I, I tended to not extend myself as, as much or as often at work in terms of being friendly enough so that uh, a person that we had both worked for for a bit of time, uh, Louise Rogers, said before she left the first job that we did together, she said, I'm going to give you some life advice, some work advice. And I go, OK, I'm open. She goes, no, I want you really to be open. I go, OK, what's the advice? She goes, I need you to talk to your coworkers. And I go, I, I, I do talk to my, she goes, no, no, not when you need things, <laughs> you know, or not when you're asking them to do something, not people who just work for you or, you know, avoiding, the, she goes, I want you to talk like you talk to your friends. And I kind of, I understood instantaneously what she meant. And I just sighed. And I think I said at the time, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I just really don't. I don't because it's the piece that, you know, that uh, we, uh, the LA times had me write. I, uh, to be friendly with somebody, I've got to relax. And work is not a very relaxing place for me, or t- typically has not been. Well, and that's a really good point that I think we need to honor, which is not everybody feels like they are safe at work because not everybody is welcomed at work and not everybody is safe at work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember early on in my career facing a tremendous amount of, you know, gender discrimination and sexual harassment. Yeah. recognizing that, you know what, these are not my friends. These are my colleagues. And I need, and I would go into work. In fact, I did it. The symbol for me was putting on my makeup because outside of work, I don't usually wear makeup. And I would put on my makeup with a real intention of like, I'm putting on a mask. Yeah. It is going to protect me. Yeah. I am going to shut down my emotions. And again, I'm not suggesting any of this is healthy. And I left those kinds of jobs. And I see this sometimes in executive coaching. It comes up, but even sometimes with friends where a person who is a person of color mm-hmm. is, or even just somebody who is, a, you know, even a white person who is naturally reserved mm-hmm. or who for other very legitimate reasons does not feel safe at work, whatever yeah. that may be. Yeah. And they are chided for that yeah. by a coworker or a supervisor who has all the privilege. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need to open up more. You need to be more vulnerable. And it's yeah. very frustrating because those people with all the privilege, and unfortunately, it's usually a white woman, is encouraging someone to do something that is not, it, it might not be innate to them. It might not come naturally or just might not be emotionally safe. Yeah, and right. yet it keeps coming up again. Yep. 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 Man, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, because, you know, you, you have to realize if you're on the other side of that, you, you feel like Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football. <laughs> Come on, you got to participate. Talk to your coworkers more. Kick the football. <laughs> and then and then you kick the football, as has been in my case. And then I remember being in a meeting and said, so-and-so is intimidated by you. It's like, oh, 
I open up a little bit and intimidation is what I get. I got you. I, right. I can't I can't be any more milk toast. You know, for years people would say, What are you doing this week? And I'd say, Gardening. Gardening, I'm been to which is true. I like to garden, but that wasn't really a sum total of what right. I spent any weekend doing. So yeah, it's interesting forwarding. And it's not I don't even wanna I don't even wanna the you know the, the the die the, the dire straight i don't i don't even want to play that card it's just it is nuanced and one should be cautious That's well and another dynamic which i've seen play out in work and in you know some television shows and movies is the white woman who really wants to be friends with the black woman or the the black man right this mm-hmm. idea that like i am going to show my you know how i have done my work on my privilege what and it's that cringy I have a friend. Look, we're friends. We're friends, whether it's at the gym or whether it's at whatever. Like, look, I'm friends with a black person. Right, right. That just, you know, those are the same women that are posting something right now about MLK Day that you just wish they wouldn't. Uh, you know, I, I have to say to, by one MLK comment, I, or maybe the beginning of my MLK comments, I've never taken it off from work because I've never had a job that would let me take it off from work. Most notably when I had, you know, a boss of color for 10 years, it was, yeah, you want to honor MLK, you go to work that day. Is, it was his attitude. But I, I can't, there's a great line from Slick Rick, uh, who I have a soft spot for. And it's just such a, a silly line, but I love it so much. And I think about it continuously through this day. And he said, if Martin Luther were here, he'd say, hey, Rick, I have a dream. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I was like, I just, I find it endlessly entertaining. Sorry, sorry, that was a digression. <laughs> we, we are known for our digressions. To, right. to come back right. again, I mean, one other practical tip that I wanted to offer is I, I have been fortunate in my executive coaching to work with a number of teams, right? usually co-owners or co-founders of a business. And some of them have not worked out and I felt like a, you know, kind of divorce counselor, but some of them have really worked out and been very, very strong relationships and with, I've had two men, two women, different configurations. And, and what I have suggested to them that seems to work well is even if you have a great work friend or work spouse or whatever language you want to use, if you have a really strong partnership, you still need to tend to it. Mm-hmm. You still need to pay attention. And so a suggestion that I make is that every so often, might be once a month, might be once a quarter, might be once a week, you want to check in. And there's mm-hmm. a specific formula that I suggest, which is first talk about what's going well, mm-hmm. right? what's working. It could be in the business. It could be in your relationship. It's, I call it appreciative inquiry. That is what it's called in the coaching world. Always start with appreciative inquiry. So here's something that I really appreciated, right? Like Eugene, I love what you said in the last podcast that was super helpful when we did X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is to talk about, are there any challenges? And often this is good if there's one person that's suggesting that this process be employed, let the Mm -hmm. other person talk. Mm -hmm. Anything that's been difficult. Mm -hmm. And then if your work partner says to you, yeah, you did this thing, Mm -hmm. you want to be really intentional about how you discuss that. Do a lot of validating. Validate, validate, validate. Validating that someone else has an emotion is not agreeing with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I could say to you, I hear you, th- I hear you, it sounds lame, but I, I, so Eugene, what I am understanding is that when I said this, you heard it as this and you were super frustrated and that really, really bothered you. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm just mm-hmm. restating to you what I heard, but I'm right. acknowledging, yeah, you had this emotion. It was real. It was significant yep. to you. Yep. Then have a conversation about what could we do differently. Right. right. So so next time when I'm addressing something, how could I phrase that? What might be a better time to approach you? And then, you know, if you need to be liberal with apologies, right? And and having what that does to do that process. And a lot of times clients have kind of rolled their eyes and they mm-hmm. find that the first few times they try this, the challenges are very mild. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the other day you were loud on the phone in our shared office something Mm -hmm. innocuous, then it, but you're building the muscle so that Mm -hmm. you can, and you know, again, this depends on, on the partnership, but so many people are very conflict diverse that you need to practice having little conflicts. You need to practice even with somebody that you work with really effectively. How do we navigate a disagreement? How do we navigate hurt feelings? Mm -hmm. You're, you're smiling. What are you thinking? (laughs) Because, uh, uh, I am distinctly and uniquely 
uh, uh, ill-suited for this portion of the show. <laughs> I think I do it very poorly. and uh, But I, I don't do what I really don't like other people to do. And I don't, I'm not, what is that word that starts with a D? Uh, defensive. I'm not defensive. Um, and I, I don't feel a special need to counterattack. Um, but I, I, I consider myself to be like an amoeba, right? Like if it's the water's too hot, the amoeba goes over here. If it's too bright, the amoeba goes over here. You know, I'm glad to have you speak your piece, but I just don't want to be there when you speak it. <laughs> you know, so this is, yeah, you say conflict avoided and I go, yeah, that's, that sounds, that sounds like me because I'm fully willing to engage, but then it becomes a zero sum game and it's to the death and I, nobody needs that. So, But I think part of it is the assumption is if you've got a work partner or a yes. work friend, you know them and you should use what you already know to facilitate that relationship. For example, we have known each other for over three decades. We have worked together at multiple places. I know you don't like conflict. Correct. <laughs> I love conflict. Right. I think I think a good fight cleans out the pipes and is like good for everything. And I enjoy that kind of energy. You are yeah. not that person. No, right? because and, I'm, I'm a stewer and a grudge holder. So but, but I right. know those things to be true. So, you know, we haven't had found it necessary to have words. I mean, you may be holding a grudge that I remember, but I don't remember us having conflict in over 30 years. Correct. Right. And and so I think part of it is also acknowledging and staying based in what? Well, we had a little one <laughs> and I could grossly overreact at, at our, our last company together. And you said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And you really you expertly, you know, executive coach jujitsu me into like I felt I felt like I was a child. And you were like, ah. and I was like, <sighs> Okay, let's go back <laughs> to work. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I was like, yeah, she's a pretty good executive coach. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, let's just, let, I, of course, I did have wiped that from my brain. Um, I don't even remember that. But again, let's just look at what, what that is as an example, right? So I we were on Zoom. We are not in the same place. Yeah. So obviously, I was attuned enough to you yeah. okay, to see a signal of distress. You know, which isn't always like you can be pretty subtle with that, right? Like you don't necessarily wear your heart on your sleeve in that way. So I signaled distress and I remembered, oh, right, this feels like conflict to him. It doesn't feel like conflict to me, but it feels like conflict to him. So I'm going to just de-escalate, right? And, yep. and you talk about this idea of like feeling like a little, a little kid, mm -hmm. you know, which has a lot of kind of cultural freight, but let's just talk about a, an emotional attunement. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that that we do as mammals is mm -hmm. we ideally co-regulate one another. And, and an example of a child is a good one, right? My granddaughter, who is four, fell down yesterday and scraped her knee, right? She's bleeding. It's 17 degrees outside. She loses her little marbles. And what do I do, right? I pick her up. I'm holding her. I'm talking softly. What is happening is that my nervous system is regulating her nervous system and downgrading her, all of her emotional reactions because I'm staying very calm and mm. trying to be soothing. And that doesn't just happen with children. It happens with adults all the time. And it's not manipulation. It's how we are as mammals. Yeah. And so the idea of being mindful that you can, particularly with someone that you know or trust or are connected to, you can co-regulate another person just by, you know, if I had come at you with an, you know, like big energy or gotten defensive or even just like leaned into the zoom camera, that would have been dysregulating as opposed to whatever it is that I did that felt like a soothing pat on the shoulder. Given, given the book, I, uh, one of the books I've written, uh, the fight one, I'm speaking of fight, everything you want to know, but ask a king, but forget you get your asking for asking. I find that when I've been in situations where um, a street scuffle is being forced upon me, I do exactly what you're saying. I tend to lower my voice. Um, I try to spread calm um, because I can see that the other person is about to make a really bad tactical error. And uh, to the outside world, it looks like, well, they were just talking and then things. And sometimes it works. And then sometimes I find that people... Um, much like a balky child, you know, resent and reject the 
the calming, right? They, they feel it's disrespectful. Um, so about half the time you end up scuffling anyway. And, you know, but at least you went into it, you know, with the best of intentions and tried to, tried to, tried to normalize. Um, Which is so. an excellent call out. There are people, particularly people you don't know as well, who yeah. might find that sort of calming tone or effort to deescalate to be um, minimizing or disrespectful. So that's a good yeah. call out. Hey, do you want to, do you have a, um, Fire me. Sort of, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in a, in a strong way. Uh, before we, we uh, left for the break, you remember talking uh, me talking about um, the impending layoffs at Google and they have hit. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, my spies at Google, only two have been claimed uh, by it. But I, I found it super interesting and they are both completely happy. Uh, with it because of the fact that um, Google has this really great, uh, th they have like six months pay. They still get their bonuses. They still get use of the facilities. Um, there are a certain amount of the facilities. Um, but one of the things I thought that they do, and it's just so strange for a company whose model for a long time had been whatever, I don't remember what it is, don't do evil or, or something. Um, they do a couple of things. Okay. If, I mean, at this point, you were working at home, so everybody's going out to check it on the company server before. But if you don't do that and you go into your workspace here in Mountain View and your badge won't work for the door that you usually go in, it won't work for any door but one door. <laughs> at that door is an HR person who's standing who diverts you over the them and the security guard, diverts you over to the side office right at the front there. And they explain to you that you have been reorged out and that they'll send you the stuff off your desk and good luck to you. Um, in the case where you were working from home, as happened to one of my, my spies there, he goes to log on to the server, access denied. He, however, can send one to his, his direct report and say, hey, my system is kind of here. And then they say, yeah, we need to tell you. And, and there's something about it that I found especially irksome. <laughs> it just seemed, um, it just seemed I, I, sleazy a little bit. I can't think of any other word it's, that really- It's dehumanizing. These yeah, are people who yeah. have lost their jobs, in many cases, their healthcare coverage, or they're going too soon. There was, a, there was something in the New York Times this weekend that talked about the phrase right sizing and yes. how that is dehumanizing. These are yeah. layoffs. These people are going to be unemployed. Yes. And that's significant. That's significant financially, like I said, with healthcare. It's also significant to people's self-esteem. A lot of people are very attached to what they do for a living, particularly people who are working at Google. I'm sure these are people who often talk about working at Google or some of these other large companies. Their mothers are saying to their mother's friends, oh, you know, my, my daughter's at Amazon or whatever. And so there's a lot riding on that. And to use language like yeah. a riff or right sizing, you know, it's, it, you call it a layoff. Right. It's yeah. not you're not reorganizing. You are getting rid of people who are no longer going to be getting a paycheck from you. At least give them the dignity of not gaslighting them by pretending yeah. that this is some natural function of I mean, it is a natural function of late stage capitalism. But, you know, let's at least name it as what it is, which is yeah. you don't have a job anymore. Well, and also let's go back to our work friendships. You are also being denied access to the, the company Slack channel. Can't say goodbye to anybody. Right. <laughs> I know. I mean, given the way things are these days, you really can't say goodbye to anybody because I sincerely doubt that you have remembered all of your work friends' phone numbers. Right. Or in fact, emails, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a naming convention that you use. It's probably the first initial last name at google.com or some such thing. But I just found it to be, I found it to be really, and, and moreover, the ones who haven't been laid off, and I'm sure people on the, on the executive level, L5 or L6 or however, I think they, they do it at, at Google, they, they're not seeing that other side where the chilling effect it has, you know, among and amidst the the other cats who are working there, the people who are working there. And the reality of it is, it's a, like you suggested, there's a wide variety. I got a guy who's going through a divorce. His group is being deactivated. He's got child support payments to be. He can't concentrate on work now right. <laughs> at this point. 
making it more likely that he'll be riffed out as well. So it's 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 a weird place to be. And it's they're not uh, si- uh, there was other company Centuria who just got like a big influx of 183 million dollars of kind of startup cash and then turns around and lays off 100 people. It, it's just a strange time as people try to deal with, you know, kind of, the, you know, the first quarter. I don't know. I, it's just, it's a very strange, yeah, strange thing. It is. Times. It is. So go ahead. If you are one of those people who have been laid off, get in touch. You know, maybe we'll start having guests this year, you know, get in touch and, and we'll put you on the show. We'll talk to you. If you want to get in touch, WTF at badbossbrief.com. And I have to say, yeah. one of the guys that laid off, I'll just share this with you and I'll share this with you in the way that it was shared with me. Um, and this might affect how sorry you want to feel for the guy. It's like, yeah, you know, so-and-so is, uh, you know, they're paying him $72,000. And I was like, oh yeah, that's for Google. He goes, a month. <laughs> Uh, well, and then, uh, maybe don't listen to that. Sorry for that. <laughs> maybe, right. maybe that one, that guy, we don't necessarily need to hear from. But everybody else that has, you know, been laid off. WTF at badbossbrief.com. That's all we've got time for this week. We will see you in a couple weeks. Thanks. Adios. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Bad Boss Brief podcast with your hosts, Eugene S. Robinson and Stephanie Payrollo. You can check out more of their work by visiting consigliera.substack.com for Stephanie and eugenesrobinson.substack.com for Eugene. You can also find Eugene at Mr. Sleep 3, that's number 3, on Instagram. Reach out with your questions, concerns, workcase situations, or suggestions to us at WTF at badbossgrief.com. We personally answer every submission. Be sure to join us at badbossbrief.substack.com every other Wednesday for episodes of Bad Boss Brief and every single week for our Sub Rosa shorts so you can gain further insights into your workplace environments. Until next time, don't be an asshole at work. Thank you.